Hi, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for participating in the Japanese rice flour online workshop with Zachary Goldberg today. My name is Erin, and I'll be your host this afternoon. I hope you'll enjoy our workshop. Well, let's welcome our Japanese rice flour ambassador chef, Zachary Goldberg. So, Zachary, please say hi to our workshop attendees. Hello, everybody. Welcome to my house. I'm sorry we can't do this in person, but I'm、um, I'm excited to have you joining in, and I appreciate you taking a little bit of time out of your day to、uh, to to focus on Japanese rice flour with us. Great, thank you. How do you like to use the Japanese rice flour? I yes, I I love working with this stuff.、Um, I would like to give just a quick、uh, introduction to my career, so people have who don't know me will have a little bit of an understanding. I've had the opportunity to work with、um, everything from a corporate hotel all the way to mom and pop bakeries and everything you can imagine in between. Have worked with、uh, world champion bakers and pastry chefs,、uh, Moff, and、uh, have opened my own bakery in 2011,、uh, and have since been making big strides towards trying to feed people the highest quality ingredients and、uh, the best craftsmanship. Uh, possible for the types of foods that we make. Now, with the Japanese rice flour, the reason that I have, have had the opportunity to work with that is because I started making、uh, some gluten-free products for some family members that were intolerant to wheat, and also for members of my staff. Believe it or not, at a bakery that were not able to eat wheat or any gluten products. So I began to experiment with. Uh, these flowers, these different types of flowers and different styles, different methods that that other bakeries are using in Europe and in、uh, South America and across the United States and Canada, where、uh, people are trying to experiment with other flowers and see what kinds of products they can make. Well, as I started to do these experiments myself and communicate with other bakeries,、uh, with other bakers and and、uh, people do, running gluten free bakeries. I uh, coincidentally uh, came across the Japanese rice flour, and it really changed things for me overnight. So I've been extremely excited to be working with this stuff because it has really、uh, absolutely shifted my perception on gluten free. Where once it was a very difficult、uh, task to try to make a bread that that felt like bread or a cake that felt like cake and tasted like cake. Using all gluten-free flours, but once I started using the Japanese rice flour,、um, it, it changed the game for me completely, and I've now been able to adapt myself to how to use this flour. It's very easy.、Uh, it's very. It's very.、Uh, it comes each time that you use it. You're going to have a great degree of、um, consistency. It's always going to arrive lump-free, and it's always going to arrive. Uh, with a level of freshness that you're you're going to be able to con- to count on time and time again, if you've been sitting on that bag for bag of flour for three months or for a year or for three weeks, whatever, it's always going to act the same. So for me,、uh, using Japanese rice flour was was a big change in my、uh, ability to experiment in the realm of gluten free. Thank you for sharing. So now, based on your experience of using Japanese rice flour,、um, would you like to introduce the future of Japanese rice flour? Yeah, I'd be happy to.、Um, the primary feature that、uh, people want to focus on here is that it is gluten free. Now, I mean, we all know that about rice, but what makes <clears throat> Japanese rice flour different from other rice flours that you're going to find? Is the level of quality. So when you're trying to make、um, breads from a myriad of different flours that are that are gluten free, from、uh, flours that are high in in lysine, you know, like legume flours, and other flours that are very high in fat, like almond flour, coconut flour,、um, or fla- flours that are just pure starch, like tapioca flour or something like that. You're going to be running into a series of different、um, challenges, but with the Japanese rice flour, you're going to find the consistency is there,、uh, the ability to adapt recipes to、um, gluten-free by using the Japanese rice flour. It's going to kind of change the way you you think about gluten-free baking. In that,、uh, 
um, it's going to open up the potential to be able to make uh, foods that are that otherwise seemed impossible to reach. But the proteins in the Japanese rice flour, the proteins in rice are uh, once hydrated. They have similar qualities to that of gluten in that there's a little bit of elasticity. Now that means that it'll retain gas. So when you talk about baking a myriad of different products that you want to have a texture similar to bread that's made with wheat or made with rye flour, uh, you're going to be able to do that using, using rice flour. But specifically, the reason that Japanese rice flour is going to work so well for you is its level of consistency and the, uh, the high level of quality going into the farming methods behind them. Thank you. So the first characteristics of Japanese rice flour was gluten-free. So the second characteristics of Japanese rice flour is, I believe it's lump-free, is that correct? Yes, it, it's lump-free. And what that means um, to, to us as bakers is that when I've got a couple, I've got three different styles of of the Japanese rice flour here with me. And what that means is that it's when it arrives at your door, you're not going to have, you can pour the bag out and it's all going to come out in this very fine powder of identical particle size. And even though each brand is different, the particle size that are in each of these bags of flour is going to be identical. And the reason for this, this will be the third one. They all feel differently. Some of them will feel a little bit like, talcum powder, very, very fine, and other ones will feel a little more coarse, but every particle will be like talcum or will be coarse. The particle size is identical. And the way that happens is that, you know, we, we understand, we understand Japanese food to be of very high quality. When we think of different countries that focus on their cuisines as, as really something that is special and something that is cherished, we all think of Japanese cuisine as something that is a special type of food. And so we know that the culture of Japan cares very much about the quality of its food. And so every step along the way, that care is taken. Now, rice has been grown for centuries upon centuries in Japan. And you're going to find throughout Japan, different regions are growing the rice that's appropriate to that region. And the mills that are located there are going to be using the rice that is of that region. So each mill is going to be milling a different uh, variety of flour. But what makes it uh, lump-free, what makes it really, despite the different variety, what makes it so um, consistent is the, uh, the invention of this type of mill that's being used in Japan right now, which is a, uh, it's a cooled jet of air that's forced through very small holes this jet of air pushes in through a cylinder and as the grains fall through the grains are forced to bounce into one another with this cool air and they cannot come out the other side until they're an identical particle size so there's no friction aside from the grains themselves that are touching each other so it's it's not going to be like a, a roller mill or a stone mill or a hammer mill or any of that you're going to see um, only this coming through the jet mill. And uh, this method, if you've got the, the humidity level of the rice just perfect, as that goes through the mill and comes out as powder on the other side, the flour itself is going to be, as I said, of identical particle size and it's of the right uh, uh, humidity. So when it goes into the bag, it, it will not coagulate again. It will be, it will come to you lump free. Now, that is very nice on a practical level from a baker's standpoint, because say you're the chef or the owner or whatever, and you, you are the one that creates the recipes. When you create your recipe, you know this is going to be consistent week after week, month after month, year after year. It's going to be consistent because that is what Japanese rice flour does. And so that means once you have created a recipe, you can pass it off to your sous chef and you can trust that it's going to come out right. Um, in, in when we talk about wheat baking, um, we very often run into the situation every uh, September, November, right around there, where the new harvest comes in, and it's a, you know all bets are off, and you got to you got to mess with your recipes again to get it right. But with the Japanese rice flour, it's not going to be that way. It's going to come to you lump free. It's going to come to you as this perfect little 
powder package that you can make a very consistent recipe with. Thank you. It sounds like Japanese rice flour is very easy to handle. So how about the third characteristics, crumble free? Well, this is um, probably the factor that makes uh, Japanese rice flour maybe the most attractive to us bakers. Um, because when we look at crumble free, we're examining how the, the structure of the dough performs. You see, I can bend this and it doesn't fall apart. Uh, this is this is kind of the nature of working with Japanese rice flour. This loaf is, is several days old, um, and yet it's still pliable. It was able to retain gas. Uh, it, it's able to absorb fat, to absorb water in a way that, that other flours just can't do, especially flours that are going to be higher in lysine. You're not going to see that, uh, that, that capability in, in them. And when it comes to uh, the consistency that, you're, that you want in flour, that is going to give you the, that, that assured feeling that once you've made a recipe, you know it's going to work. And now that you found Japanese rice flour, you've started to use it, you're finding that it, it makes a pliable bread that tastes like bread, a bread that feels like bread. Now you can compare it to some of the loaves that are on the market now that are using a myriad of different flours and are often bound together with either egg white or xanthan gum or gum arabic. And these, you know, they, they may look like a, a normal loaf of bread, but they tend to crackle apart and the texture is not so lovely. If you're the, the person eating a sandwich or something, it tends to crackle apart and crumble apart. So what's nice about working with Japanese rice flour from this perspective is you can make a cake or uh, a bread or a scone or anything like this. And you're going to have that, um, that ability to, to tear off a piece without it crumbling into a hundred little pieces. See, I can tear this in half and it doesn't, it doesn't fall apart. It's, it's still pliable. It's still malleable. So this is the feature when we talk about crumble free, that's it's the crumb, your crumb stays moist and it retains the fat in I see. Um, do you mind coming a little bit closer to the camera to show us the yeah. bread? Yeah. Can you guys see me okay here? So see, I, wobb I wobble it back and forth. It doesn't crumble apart. I can break it. It's not falling off into pieces. Does that make sense? So it stays moist. It's, this is, it has the flavor and the aroma of, of bread as, you, as if you were making it with rye or with wheat, but it's 100% rice. So it's 100% gluten-free, you know, some... It's very easy to work with. I, you, you really. This is one of those things where you're not going to understand it until you start baking with it. The, the stark difference between baking with Japanese rice flour versus baking with um, rice flours from other countries or other types of gluten-free flours. Great, thank you. So even though it is gluten-free, delicious bread can be made with Japanese rice flour easily because of its lamb-free and crumble-free characteristics, I see. Well, I would love to try some if I got the chance to. So, all right, now let's take a look at the demonstration video on how to use Japanese rice flour. In this video, you can see Chef Zachary's baking advice and techniques based on his experience with Japanese rice flour. Hi, so we're going to be mixing a rice flour cheese bread today. It's a lovely recipe, gluten-free recipe, that's going to be using exquisite Japanese rice flour. One of the things that you'll find in using rice flour for pastry application is that it's going to be very delicate and you'll have to treat it something like a pâte sucre, something like a sugar dough. So it's you're going to be mixing it ahead of time and making sure you've got all the ingredients combined, but it's going to have to coalesce and temper inside of the uh, refrigerator. So you may wanna make it four to six hours in advance. I would suggest doing it a day before so you know that it's completely solid and the fat and the starch have homogenized completely. Then once it's been uh, tempered in the refrigerator, you're going to temper it again at room temperature so that it begins to become a little bit soft and malleable 
You're going to mix it once, place in the refrigerator. Once it is completely solid, you're going to bring it out and you can either knead it or you can layer it. And I will show you both techniques. Without further ado, we'll get started on the mix. I start with the rice flour. I combine my salt. And usually when I combine the dry ingredients, the next is the Parmesan. I like to use a whisk for this application. One of the nice things about Japanese rice flour is that consistently brand over brand, every single type of rice flour that I've tried coming from Japan is going to be completely lump free. So when you pour it out of the bag, you're never going to have any clumps. It's never going to happen. It doesn't happen. Now we're going to add in the fat, which is butter. And this we're going to cut in using a stiff bowl scraper. So I like to put a little flour on top and then begin to cut, cut flour in. And once I've got my butter broken apart some, into we'll say fingertip or fingernail size pieces. Then I'm going to add my water and the whole thing will very quickly come together. It's a very easy flour to work with, extremely consistent particle size. And that's due to the milling technique that is used for the Japanese rice flour. It's quite remarkable and very consistent. So at this stage, we're going to add the water. And I'm going to gently, just the same as you would with the pâte sucre, I'm going to very gently roll the ingredients together. I don't want to slop around the bowl. I want to be nice and gentle. So first I cut it in and then I will begin to roll it on top of itself. The aroma is very, very nice. One of the key things to making this dough come out very nicely is to make sure your ingredients are really quite homogenous. You don't want to have any chunks of butter left. You want to make sure that cheese is very integrated into the dry flour before you start adding other ingredients. The mixing process, I would say, is, is half of the the challenge of this. I'm going to roll it out onto the surface. Make sure I have some dusting flour. I like to use a layering technique. It tends to incorporate the ingredients really cleanly. And we'll use the layering technique also when this dough is finished. So you can see that the dough is now all one color. All the ingredients are incorporated. You can look into the inside of the dough and you, you won't find any butter pieces. You won't find any uh, clumps of cheese and you definitely won't find any clumps of flour because the flour doesn't clump. So we're all set to put this into refrigeration. Sometimes a little bit of flour on the outside can make it easier to handle. And this I'm going to wrap up and put into refrigeration and we will have the ability to use this in a few hours. So I'm just going to wrap this up in plastic so that it, the dough doesn't oxidize overnight. Doesn't have to be too tight, just covering all surfaces. Now I already have some made from before, from yesterday. And I want to show you two different methods for how you can work with this. One is going to be layering. And I suggest doing the layering if you're going to be making cheese sticks or grissini 
Um, and you could even use it if you wanted to do, say, a quiche crust. Uh, but for the lavash, for the lavash, which is like a cracker, I would suggest actually kneading it by hand a little bit. And I'll show you how to do that. First, we'll start off by layering using a rolling pin. You want a little flour on top, a little flour on the bottom. And you're going to use, you're going to use a crisscross pattern so that you get even compression from top and bottom. So that means I'm going to apply pressure with the rolling pin in one direction, then I change directions and apply pressure like this. I'm going to flip the dough over and do the same thing on this side. At first, the dough will be stiff, much like a pat sucre would be. But eventually, as you start to apply pressure, it begins to be something that you can roll out. And it doesn't really matter if you get little ends on the side like this, because as we layer, we'll do it three times. It kind of comes out with the wash. I want to make sure that I have a little flour on both sides. And I'm going to take it out into a rectangle so that I can cut out some cheese sticks and some grassini. Now the difference between the two is in many cases just a matter of opinion. But sometimes grassini can look a little more elegant for say a cocktail party or something like that. And cheese sticks might be a good suit for a, a snack for the kids or something also that you can put in the pastry case if you run a gluten-free bakery and wanna be serving something that is above and beyond the average gluten-free product. So I'm gonna take it to about four, three or four millimeters, not too thick but just thick enough that I can handle it. You'll see that the protein in the rice flour is going to be uh, slightly active. So as you squeeze on it, as you pull on it, it pulls back a little bit. And that's a really nice feature with the Japanese rice flour is very consistent results every time you work with it. So as I trim the edges, this can be reused. I end up with a pretty clean rectangle And now from here, I like to save that pile and that will go into the next round. From here, I can make cheese sticks, which are say a half inch, give or take. I'm going to lay them onto the sheet tray, evenly spaced apart. You can actually fit a lot more on the sheet tray if you're doing this professionally and you want to maximize what you're getting out of the oven. The grissini. Now, sometimes for the grissini, I like them to be just a little bit thinner. Maybe four millimeters for the cheese sticks and three millimeters for the grissini, something like that. Because we did the layering technique and because the Japanese rice flour is extremely consistent, you can expect to get a little bit of a rise as it is in the oven. So while it looks flat right now, when this comes out of the oven, it's going to have a rounded top to it. And because of the milling technique, the protein in the rice flour, in the Japanese rice flour is never damaged. So you wanna make sure to keep these pretty straight as you go. I give them a little tiny, tiny tug, a little pull as I lay them on the pan. So as I said, this is nice for cocktail parties and other, other events where you've got lots of people that, that want to have a little snack, but want to look elegant while they're snacking. I'd like to move on to the lavash. Um, I, I want to say that this dough is, is really quite an extraordinary dough. Um, the, the Japanese rice flour pulls in the fat in just such a way that it allows you to layer the dough, which creates a crispiness, a flakiness that I've never seen in any other gluten-free flour. And to boot, I've never seen it in any other type of rice flour. So when I'm working with Japanese rice flour, I know that I've got a wide range of versatility of what I can do with the product. And I also know that I'm going to have a consistency 
meaning month after month, year over year, I'm gonna get this very same product, lump free and, and very easy to work with, the same particle size for, for pretty much you know, the entirety of the flower that's, that's in your hands. So for this one, I don't necessarily have to use the uh, rolling pin until the end when I'm really flattening it. I can just begin to take the dough out with my hand and just roll it back up. And you see it starts to get a little rough like it was when we were mixing. But what this will do is it will uh, sort of tenderize the dough a little bit. It makes it, it aerates it a little bit in a way that layering doesn't quite do. So that can be nice for a cracker because we're not looking to get a rise so much from the cracker. We're looking to have a nice, even, flat, yet crumbly cracker. I'll take it out with the rolling pin. It will be very easy to do with the rolling pin at this point because it's pretty soft. Right. Keep adding flour because it will stick to the table a little bit, much as a pet sucre would. Then when it's nice and thin, save my scraps for another lavash later. I'm going to take what I have here and you'll see it peel off very nicely. And it's got enough protein in it that you can hold it like this and it doesn't tear. So this is very nice. Now when I lay it on the the sheet pan, one thing that's key is to make a few little holes. We call that docking. If you have an actual docker, that's what I would suggest. If you have a fork, you could use a fork. If you have a pastry cutter or a pizza cutter, you can just make a few incisions. Okay, so this is going to go into an oven, all three of these at 180 degrees or 350 degrees sorry, 180 degrees Celsius or 350 degrees Fahrenheit. So I'm gonna go ahead and load these into the oven. And again, since I'm baking from a home oven, I want to make sure to rotate in the middle of the bake. And we will be baking until they're golden brown. All right, the lavash is ready. And it appears the grissini is ready. And we're gonna give the cheese sticks just a few more minutes. They're a little bigger, a little thicker. They need to bake a little bit longer. But you can see you've got a nice blistering, makes a lovely cracker, and also make a nice quiche crust. And here you've got these very elegant, long, thin, uh, little grissini that are lovely to put into a cocktail glass or something like that. So it looks like our cheese sticks are ready. And you can see how they have come up in volume with a nice rounded layer and they're very, very light, very airy. And that's through the layering technique. So if you don't want it airy, if you want it a little denser, but still crispy, then using the, the mashing technique with the, the back of your hand, folding it over and mashing with your hand, that's gonna give you a lavash, or if you don't cut it, you can use it for a quiche crust or a tart crust or something like that. Uh, but the layering technique is gonna help for your grissini and your cheese sticks to give it a nice rounded uh, top to it. And this makes it of course more attractive and flakier as you bite it.
Great. Well, even through the screen, I, I feel like I could smell the deliciousness of the cheese stick. Do you have any other suggestions, Chef Zachary? Oh, gosh. Well, I mean, that, that recipe is just wonderful. I think that it's, uh, th that wasn't my recipe, by the way. I didn't create that one. That one uh, was, was given to me by the purveyor of that particular flower. And, um, you know, we're passing it on to, to everybody to give it a try. But it's, it's just, it was so versatile. As somebody who's done a lot of research with different uh, ways to approach gluten-free, uh, th that one, that I honestly felt like that recipe was was one of these kind of cover all your needs kind of recipes. And it was also really easy to make. So while it was easy to make, it applied to so many different um, types of food. So uh, I was able to make savory tart shells with it. I was able to make quiche, you know, actually baking the custard in with the with that as the crust. And um, uh, as you saw, the grissini and the lavash and the uh and the cheese sticks it, it comes as the cheese sticks recipe and and so that's probably the 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 application that it was intended for but there's just so much you can do with it um the nice thing is uh about this is that it really has quite a long shelf life so if you are uh, running a gluten-free bakery you could put it in some cellophane and then you know it's good for days I, i've been able to keep it in my house for days my kids my kids love this dough, so I actually keep some on hand. Since I've been working with Japanese rice flour, I keep that cheese pastry uh, dough on hand in the refrigerator or in the freezer, and then I break it out every now and then. My kids get really excited when they see that there's about to be some cheese sticks in the house. So, <laughs> kind of fun. Thank you, Chef. So, um, if you would like to know more about Japanese rice flour, we do have an official website. You can just type in Japanese rice flour J Fudo at the search, maybe Google, and this website will pop up. This is the top page. It will it'll look like this. And in the website, you can find out about different Japanese rice flour brands, products, as well as recipes, and also uh, real chefs and what they are think what they think of about Japanese rice flour. So Chef Zachary, thank you very much for sharing your experience and work with the Japanese rice flour today. Oh, it's absolutely my pleasure. Um, again, I wish that we had been able to do this in person, although in a certain sense, we're able to reach, uh, you know, a, a, a wider uh, girth of people by by doing this online. I just think it's a tough time. And, um, you know, let's try to make the best of it. We all grow a little bit. We all become a little bit better. Um, thank you for having me. I really appreciate everybody taking the time out of their day to, to listen to what I had to say. I, you wouldn't see me here if I didn't actually really love this stuff. So um, I don't know if that's convincing at all, but you really won't know until you get your hands on it. Um, and I encourage all of you to, to give it a try. And whatever you can think of baking, go for it because you're going to be able to do it. Thank you. And thank you everyone for taking the time attending the workshop today. Hope everyone stay warm and safe and I hope to see you again soon. Bye. Bye everybody.